Good morning, folks. Let's review how the government reports the weather. Despite the killer cold we just had, it's vital for their anthropogenic warming propaganda that they let you know it was hot during the cold spell, just in different places. Of course, this type of fair and balanced reporting is mysteriously absent when they're reporting the heat records. They're acting as if the western part of the country isn't blue, along with Tasmania. So when the experts across the world began describing the solar shutdown and climate extremes seems to steal the headlines while some of those experts began to even mention colder winters and a mini ice age. I felt vindicated to a degree, but the cold slap of reality is that the Pentagon knew all of this back in 2003. I'm well behind the game. The warming effects were going to be gradual, but strong winds and severe weather and cold were going to be the bigger issue especially for agricultural zones. The statement about Earth's human carrying capacity is the point I've been trying to make since the Christmas Day episode at the end of last year. They are not sure, however, whether it would be a hundred year shift or more like a thousand. This article is another complement to the rogue planet concepts discussed in Chapter 3 of Starwater. Remember a few weeks ago there was another object about 600 AU out? I'd bet that one and this one are captured rogues. Firewater. Supercritical water. Water that aids fire. Remember the chemistry article last week that should shift what we know about planets and stars because at high pressures the laws of chemistry seem to break down. Well, it appears there is a version of water that aids fire under large pressures and superheated temperatures. Its phase becomes exotic and acts like a liquid gas. Can you say star water? Speaking of liquid fire, this is a video from Javier Torres showing the activity at the Pacaya volcano in Guatemala. I'm thinking maybe he should back up a bit. Rough day for the crust down there, volcano eruption and the largest quake of the day, still low enough to preclude damage. Let's get a quick ice update. Up north the Arctic is still dwindling but it does tend to bounce back nicely after the summer melts. Meanwhile the Antarctic remains well above average for almost a continuous three years straight now. Australia and New Zealand, low up north will drop more here than anywhere else. Some rain finishing now in New Zealand with cold moving in behind it. There's Ian out in the Pacific there. Bouncing over to the Indian Ocean, you can see Colin very powerful but also very lonely. Coming up now to Europe, the break is over and the next system is cresting. The strong low we've eyed for days in the Atlantic is coming on shore now. Last, let's see the U.S. and Canada, stream of warm moisture coming north and kicking off the readings on the 24-hour infrared radar here. The Bartol Cosmic Ray monitors are showing large dots indicative of solar wind impact signatures. Now, After the CME impact wane, density and speed fell off, but we're now seeing a re-rise of the curves, including the plasma temperature down in green. The most likely candidate for the shock is the coronal hole stream, the coronal hole departing now. Solar wind today will reveal for sure if we get a post density speed ramp. Looking to flaring, like we said, very slow comeback. And time's almost up as the big groups turn for the limb. I will begin looking to the twin incomers behind it. The trailer of the two appears simple, but the lead is a traditional bipolar spreader and if we're lucky by tonight it could be much bigger. That's my horse this morning. Ones on the limb we'll keep an eye on as well. Coronal fields a bit more open down south than we'd anticipated. The force down there is as major as it gets, but equatorial opening leaves our sight. Thin dark plasma filament eruption threats and other shots of our star to close. Eyes open. No fear, it's 6.15 a.m. Eastern Time and that's the news. Be safe, everyone.